Okay, so let me begin first of all before I, I would forget. We're so glad that we're sponsored or this session is being sponsored by BCU Financial and BCU Foundation. As you heard throughout the Congress, without the generous support of our sponsors, we wouldn't be able to host this event in this kind of forum. And so we're extremely grateful to those two organizations. Thank you, BCU. Also, I'd just like to mention that there are translation headsets. Should anybody want one, you can pick up a translation. And uh, I will begin our session. We have uh, a very high-powered team up here on the front. I'm extremely honored to be able to moderate this session and host it. The, uh, the opportunities for us are endless in terms of cooperation between Canada and Ukraine. And our session specifically is called Ukraine and the World Geopolitics and Rebuilding. So it has a vast, it's as vast as you think it is. The topic is wide ranging. We have four people up here who have extreme knowledge of Ukraine, of geopolitics and so on. So I'm so happy to introduce them to you. Let me begin with our uh, first guest, the Honorable uh, Dr. Lloyd Axworthy. Distinguished career serving 27 years in politics in Manitoba and in Canada. Um, he was Vice Chancellor of the University of Winnipeg and serves as, served as Canada's Foreign Minister. And that's where I first, as a, as a young uh, uh, budding politician, first heard of uh, your, your affairs. And uh, it's been excellent, has received multiple awards, uh, multiple doctorates, honorary doctorates, uh, honorary titles from First Nations, the Order of Manitoba, and the Companion of the Order in Canada. And uh, he will be addressing many of the issues surrounding uh, displaced persons, refugees, and the challenges that we face. We're also pleased to have uh, Ambassador Lydia Galadza with us, Canadian Ambassador to Ukraine. Ambassador Galadza holds an honors in political science and ethics, an MA in international affairs, has worked on strategic and policy related positions across the government in the Privy Council office, the Treasury Board, Secretariat, Public Safety Canada, National Security Policy, Social Affairs Committee of Cabinet, Citizenship and Immigration, and Peace and Stabilization Operations Program at Global Affairs Canada, and now serves, as I said, as Canada's ambassador to Ukraine. And she will address a unique perspective as being a Canadian in Ukraine and provide some of that uh, perspective for us. I'm also honored to introduce Ambassador Yulia Kovalyu, Ukraine's ambassador to Canada holding a Master's of Economics from the National University of Kiev Mohila Academy, one of the pristine universities of Ukraine, and a Master of Public Administration from the National Academy for Public Administration under the President of Ukraine, holding a wide variety of positions in the Supervisory Board of uh, Naftohaz, Deputy Head Office of the President of Ukraine, the National Investment Council of Ukraine, the National Reform Council, the National Investment Council of Ukraine, First Deputy Minister of Economics, and the National Regulatory Commission for Energy and Utilities. And Yulia Kovalyu was appointed uh, Ukraine's ambassador uh, earlier this year, I believe it was March, and we had the opportunity to host her at our children's rally with 400 uh, young people uh, at City Hall in Toronto. That was our first opportunity to meet you, although you weren't officially recognized as the ambassador, but it was a pleasure in meeting you at that uh, location. And Ambassador uh, Kovalyu will give us some perspectives on what is happening in Ukraine and what kind of support Ukraine uh, would require globally. And finally, uh, former Ambassador Roman Vashchuk, known to many of you, in particular those from the uh, Toronto community or anybody who has traveled to Ukraine in the last 10 years, um, holds an MA from the his of history from the University of Toronto. He's worked at the Commission of Inquiry and War Criminals back in 85. He joined the Department of External Affairs with prestigious positioning in uh, positions in Moscow, Kiev, and Berlin. No small task. And um, his first ambassadorial posting was to Belgrade, covering Serbia, Montenegro, and North Macedonia, and then followed by the ever-famous uh, stint as Canada's ambassador to Ukraine. And again, as I say, anybody who's done anything with Ukraine in the last 10 years certainly has, has met Roman Vashchuk, so welcome to all of you, such an elaborate and distinguished team. What we will do up front is, I just want to say, we've offered everyone an opportunity to provide some opening comments. And I'm going to begin right away with Ambassador Kovalyu to talk about Ukraine's positioning. And what I'd like to do is uh, each of them will provide their perspective, and then we'll open up the second half for questions for Q&A. 
and uh, feel free to line up your questions. If you do have something that you would like to address, um, prepare your questions in advance, get in line at the microphone so that we can prepare and make the best use of our time. This session is only one hour, um, so I wanna make good use of time. And the second thing is also if you can address your question specifically to anybody on the panel, that would be also helpful so that we can uh, address it in the most direct uh, method possible. So I hope that works for everybody. Good morning, everybody, and thank you for having this panel that gives a bit of understanding not only about the current urgent needs, what Ukraine and Ukrainian uh, people uh, are looking forward around the world, but it also, I would like for us all to come from this panel understanding why it is important, not only for Ukraine and the people of Ukraine, by, but why it is important to Canada, why it is important to other democratic countries that Ukraine won this war. And I will start maybe from a bit of the history. And since Russia on the February 21st brutally invaded to Ukraine, the, the world has changed. And as many diplomats around the world are saying that there is a tectonical shift in many of the approaches that for the decades after actually the Second World War, a lot of the diplomacy and doctrine was working on. But when we are today fighting so-called second biggest army in the world, we also call the world to learn the lessons and to learn the lessons from the mistakes that were done for the previous 20 years with dealing with Russia and other territorial regimes. When Russia started this war, it was 2014, when Russia invaded uh, into Donetsk and Luhansk region, when Russia illegally occupied Crimea, unfortunately at that time, the answer from the world was, as some diplomats say, deep concern. Um, that is the world that describes this, this approach. There were the sanctions, but whether these sanctions were enough uh, to stop Russia moving forward, sure no. Then Russia was in Syria, supporting atrocities and supporting the attacks on many of the civilians in Syria. If we look back, Russia was also invading Georgia. And the answer to these actions was deep concern. And there is, and th that's my personal point, there is a big difference between um, the approach of the authoritarian regimes and the democratic ones. And for Putin specifically, each time there is only the deep concern, each time the countries and the democratic world is trying to make some um, uh, consensus or trying to like, be more aligned and try to find and negotiate with him. Putin is actually using it as a, just a green light to go further. If we look back three weeks before the war, around that time there was a big Munich security conference and a lot of was at that time in the air. It was a lot in the media about uh, the potential invasion, the potential full-scale war. And our President Zelensky was asking the world, if you all believe that, there, that Putin will start the war, let's do preemptive sanctions. Let's show Putin a sign that we all are united and we will st stand strong and sending this message. There were discussions, but there were no sanctions. And unfortunately, you know, it also sent a signal. And then the invasion started. And that was the time that all of the democratic world rethought their policies and the huge steadfast support and the unity of the support from the very first day of the, okay, not the very first day, I think the first two, three days, there were many countries that still were thinking that Kyiv will fall. So um, 
on the fourth and forward days, that was a change. Understanding that it's Ukrainian people who are able and who are willing and who are courage to protect the country, we managed to get this support. And this support is steadfast. And I'm very grateful to Canada being one of the strongest, closest uh, ally to Ukraine. And I would like to also to link to the words that yesterday Minister Saijan said, that Canada will be with Ukraine whatever it takes and how long, and no matter how long will it take. And it's, and it's really important because we are on, on that stage that we need to have the steadfast and long-term unity of the support of Ukraine. Because what Putin is doing, he is trying to divide, he is trying to blackmail and with a disinformation campaign, he is trying to divide this unity. The unity what we, which was brought after uh, the invasion started. And there is also one, um, one thing that more and more the world is trying to evidence that you cannot negotiate with Putin. Look what, what he did with the energy. Using energy as a weapon on all of the European continent. Look just what happened yesterday. So much important Green Deal, so-called Istanbul Initiative, which allowed Ukraine to deliver millions of tons of the grain to the global south, to the Middle East. We as the country, despite of the war, our farmers were working on the fields. Unfortunately, some of them died because of the landmines on this field. But we are understanding how important it is to many countries. We, are go we want to deliver. But that is Putin, who out of the sudden made a false pretext and said, like, we are stepping out of the deal. And so many of those people who still believe in some negotiations with Putin, saying, like, there are some people who do believe that, you know, we need to negotiate. Look on even the current situation. How can you negotiate with the country who is who's just totally neglecting all the world order, who is totally neglecting any of the initiatives they were assigned for? Whether it's not the, another lesson that we need to learn through the time what Ukraine is going through. What is important for, for us in Ukraine? It's to keep the unity to support to Ukraine and to grow this unity. That's why we are also working with the other countries. And I think it was historically almost the first for many years visit of our Minister of Foreign Affairs to African countries. It's also uh, how President Zelensky himself reaching to many of the leaders throughout the world uh, with whom we haven't spoken for. 10, 20 years. Because we need to deal also with Russian disinformation. And we need to explain many countries what is happening in Ukraine. And to tackle this Russian propaganda, especially when we look on the global uh, uh, south. And Ukraine needs the voice of support everywhere, and including in Canada. Of course, Russian aggression against Ukraine influenced many pros, including the global economy. We see the inflation everywhere in a democratic world, and we see that it is becoming painful uh, for many ordinary people in many countries. But what we need also to, and of course we see that it's important for the governments, for the countries to support their, their people was these processes of inflation. But it's also important for, for the community and for you to understand that this is Putin who actually, through the breaking in of the grain export for Ukraine, increased the global food prices that also has the reflection here in Canada. This is Putin who is blackmailing Europe uh, on the with the energy resources and we, the, which are record high. 
And there are many other things with the Russian aggression and war against Ukraine has the consequences on many countries and many continents and including in Canada. And the last thing, Russia is actually the neighbor of Canada through the Arctic. And our Ukrainian soldiers are not only fighting to protect our land, but they are also helping other countries who has Russia as a neighbor to be more secure and to be more safe. Thank you so much. And in particular, that, uh, that last comment is one that uh, Canadians that we talk to really need to understand that Ukraine is fighting the world war for democracy and is defending democracies, Western democracies, and not helping Ukraine today is only going to cost more down the road. So um, with that intro, I'll turn it right over to Ambassador Galadza, who's in a unique position uh, being in Ukraine as a Canadian, and will share some of her views. Thank you very much, Martin. Uh, hello, everybody. It's really great to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Um, I'm going to start, I did a small focus group session yesterday with a group of young people, and I said, what did you want to hear about? And they said, well, what's life like? They see everything through the media, and they wanted to um, understand better what life in KU is like. And so I'll give you a little bit of, of a, a snapshot um, of, of what, that, what, it, what it's like between those outbursts that make it onto, onto Canadian media. And, uh, and, and just go through five, five quick points. Uh, and the first one about what life is like to demonstrate that I think we're only now getting into the war of attrition. Um, uh, when the sirens go off, you have to stop, you, whatever you're doing, shopping, meeting, talking, um, cooking, and decide what you're gonna do. Um, are you going to hide like you're supposed to? Are you going to end your meeting? Are you gonna get in your car and go to your next meeting? Are you going to take your kids to school or are you going to turn around and go home? Um, when the sirens go off four times a day, you're incredibly disrupted. When the electricity goes off and on and you don't know when it's going to happen, you don't know, do you open your business, do you close your business? Um, will you have time to get somewhere and pick up dinner uh, or not? Um, it is incredibly disruptive. It is dark. It is cold, and um, and there is no there is no pattern. I say these things as a Canadian in a very nice apartment um, with a very large security team, and it's disruptive for me. You can only imagine what this does to Ukrainians who had, over the course of the summer, kind of fallen back into a little bit of a way of thinking that, okay, the war is further away. In the last few years, the war has come to everyone. And, um, and it's going to continue to be very disruptive, exhausting. Uh, but I make one prediction, that it won't have one iota of an impact or make a dent in Ukraine's, uh, Ukrainian's resolve to, um, to win the war. And in fact, what I see, um, and my, my second point, is that ambition among Ukrainians remains really high despite all of this. I'm going to run through a list of issues that are being put on the table by the government of Ukraine, by the people of Ukraine, for their partners, that are asking us to figure out some really, really difficult things things because Ukraine has ambition not just for itself in winning the war but for the entirety of the free world to come out of this war into a better situation. You all know about the campaign for weapons, it's always been ambitious, but besides that there's the issue of the special tribunal for the, to try the crime of aggression for the first time. There are security guarantees and how you do that, how we ensure our collective security over the longer term. There's a Ramstein for macrofinancial assistance that they want. There is Ramstein for the coordination of international efforts to counter disinformation. 
There's dis discussions with the International Monetary Fund where Ukraine has said, you know, we need a minimum of $20 billion as the next program. There's a desire to have Russia recognized as a state sponsor of terrorism. And in the lead up to the 90th anniversary of the Holodomor, there is a desire to have more countries recognize the Holodomor as genocide. There are the United Nations General Assembly resolutions uh, that, are, that, are, that are historic and seek to underpin, reinforce uh, basic principles of the Charter of the UN. And it's hard work. There's the Green Initiative. There's the restatement of admission for NATO membership. And of course, there's the EU membership. And Ukraine has said that by the end of the year, they want to pass all the required legislation to meet those not conditions, but the criteria for then going into membership negotiations. This is ambition from the government of Ukraine, and every single week there is something new. They're not tired, they're not giving up, and they need us to help them with all of this. On the side of civil society, you also have organizations like Ukrainian Ukrainska Akademi Liderstva, who are trying to build their alumni network to be a, a national network of, of, of resilience and, and change. You've got Budui Mokrin Razum who want to scale up massively and do uh, and, and, and rebuild Ukraine on the principles of so and, and, and reinforcing social cohesion. You've got Caritas Ukraine, who is now a national has fast scaled up to be a nationally present a humanitarian agency. So You've got attrition starting, attempts at attrition. You've got ambition remaining very high. And among the highest ambition is on reconstruction. And that's my third point. I'm not going to talk about reconstruction numbers and estimates because the numbers are so high and the needs are so great that it's meaningless. Um, no one has yet conceptualized what it will look like, but I think I can hazard a few guesses about what it won't be. Um, there isn't going to be one plan for reconstruction. There isn't going to be one moment when reconstruction starts. And it's certainly not going to be just government. Government's going to have to kickstart reconstruction, but it is going to be the private sector who has to come in with the vast majority of the, of the funding and, uh, and capacity to do it, and the, and, and, and the international financial institutions as well. The investors will need to follow, and they'll need to follow very soon. And that means that a lot of stuff has to happen to, to complete the reforms that were underway before the full-scale invasion, especially those related to the judicial system in Ukraine, corporate governance in Ukraine, decentralization, and I would put the, the energy sector reforms in there as well. Um, Ukraine was very, the government of Ukraine was very quick to take these up again after the invasion. As G7 ambassadors who spend an awful lot of time talking about reforms in Ukraine, um, we were a little bit worried about wither reforms. What's going to happen? And it didn't take long at all for uh, the prime minister himself to say, yeah, of course. Yeah, no, no, we're, we're back on that. I think it was around about May when that was fully, uh, fully, uh, clear fully to us. Um, but it's not just the physical infrastructure that needs to be rebuilt or in the economic activity, but it's also the social and the societal and the invisible recovery that hap needs to happen. And that's my, my fourth point. Our support, Canada's support to Ukraine, needs to help win the war, and it has to help win the peace. We need to consolidate and institutionalize and bake in the gains that have been made by civil society since the 24th of February. That unity that we have seen emerge, it didn't emerge, it just, it, it materialized. The trust in the government that exists now, that didn't exist before. The relationship between civil society organizations and government that didn't exist before. You all, you know Ukraine, it was a parallel, these were parallel universes. And now there is something else happening in the country that needs to be consolidated. We need, as I think as Canada and the work we do in Ukraine, need to knit back a tighter uh, social fabric to consolidate that democracy and to ensure resilience. It's an unprecedented unity that, that we see. Um, but difficult times will come. You already see a little bit. What's a collaborator? Um, why, did the second why did the second bridge not blow up in Kherson? 
Where were the, where are, have been the, the strategic, where were the strategic reserves of ammunition or, or food in the military? These are the things that people quietly say are going to be the questions that need to be answered someday. Language issues. Um, so uh, to win the war and lose the peace would be a tragedy. So that's something that we have to look forward to. Actually, don't look forward to it. We have to start thinking about it now with Ukrainians who are already thinking about it. My final point is on geopolitics, and Yulia covered a lot of this uh, really well. Nothing will be the same. I wrote that down. It will not be the same world again. And Ukraine is fighting for a cause that has global, uh, global resonance and, and, and relevance. The thing that I would say to this audience is that uh, two things. First, Canada is leveraging its entire diplomatic presence in the world to advocate for Ukraine. Not because we know Ukraine better than a lot of countries, but because that's actually our interest. And this is what we as Canadians need to understand, and this is what we as Ukrainian Canadians need to make sure we share with other Canadians. And the second point is, yesterday I was on a plane, and this girl beside me, she was 16 years old, born in Winnipeg, of uh, Egyptian Sudanese uh, parents. And um, she pretended to not know much about Ukraine, and then she came out with the answer to this question. She said, so... What do you say to people when they ask you why we should be giving, why we're giving all of this money, all of this effort to Ukraine? I gave her my answer. She thought it was a good answer. I'm not going to share it with you right now. But I'm, I, my point to all of you is all geopolitics is local, especially here in Canada. And I think that uh, this is going to be a long fight um, that has global importance. And as the Ukrainian Canadian community, I think you've done a really neat job of li linking in with other diasporas that are implicated in this conflict, in this war with the Iranians most recently. And more of that needs to happen so that Canadian support, the kind that we've seen, will continue um, into the, well into the future and will have cross-party uh, cross support and uh, uh, support right across the country from people of all nationalities. So they see this as their fight and their interests. That was just wonderful. And uh, speaking of uh, how we can gain support and do more in Canada, I'm going to turn to former Ambassador Roman Voschuk to talk a little bit more about what we can do in Canada as a diaspora. And I'll turn it over to you, Romko. Uh, thank you. There were discussions here during the resolutions, discussion about support, how to channel support. Uh, I think it's important to stay focused, organized, and mobilized now through this sort of gray zone of the conflict. I think uh, Larissa was talking about attrition. Uh, we have the word rebuilding here. There won't be a magic moment a single magic moment when the war is capital O over and suddenly the, uh, you know, the construction crews go out and start rebuilding. The preconditions for that are being laid now. Uh, in my current job as business ombudsman of Ukraine, uh, I'm seeing the transformations that are happening in the Ukrainian business community people are actually reshaping, rebuilding, and in some cases, expanding their businesses now. They're not waiting for the magic moment of rebuilding. And that means that we, to some extent, and as a community, need to filter out some of the dramatic day-to-day -day news that tends to preoccupy us and look at those underlying trends and how we can support them. Uh, the uh, sovereignty bonds that were announced here at this Congress are an important tool for that, that helps fund Ukraine as a whole, but also uh, looking to support those humanitarian and civil society initiatives that are self-starting, self-reproducing, and multiplying in Ukraine. Uh, the it's interesting to see how, for example, IT companies are leveraging what they can do to develop new technologies for the military that are, in future will be dual use for our country's militaries as well. 
Uh, Ukraine is now a world leader in things. And I think uh, what's also important psychologically in all of this is to be able to identify and support success where it exists. Uh, one of the things that we run into as people who are very supportive and as advocates is uh, the notion that uh, we always need to strive for more, yes. But in order to base our efforts on something firm and solid, we need to accept, accept that there have been success and that there is support. We have in Canada over 80% support for Ukraine. Across Europe, there's 70, 70 plus percent support for Ukraine. People, even in countries that were wavering like Germany, are willing to put on the extra sweater in winter to support Ukraine. In the European Union, People now, the political leadership now thinks of Ukraine as one of us. When Chancellor Schultz in Berlin said, Ukraine will be rebuilt as a member of the European Union, that is huge. That means that there is a new shift in paradigm. That means that when you are sending uh, money for a project to Ukraine, you should be thinking, how will that money work not only this year, but next year and the year after in a Ukraine that is already on its way into the European Union. So it's a, uh, it's a matter of filtering the noise, staying focused on those positive things that are happening and how we can harness them for, uh, and I think that's already being done uh, by, for example, by the Canada Ukraine Foundation, in having a Ukraine that is able to further adapt, further build, further grow, not as one sudden shift, but as a process that basically starts today and will be moving forward into the future. Um, it's certainly great to have a speaker here who's been at the whole Congress and can pull live examples from each of the sessions. So I appreciate that tremendously. And again, thanks for your years of effort. Uh, on more than one occasion, uh, I had the opportunity to meet Ambassador and he certainly helps so many organizations and I appreciate you looking forward already, always thinking ahead um, and not just for the current moment. Uh, speaking of thinking ahead and the current moment, we have millions of refugees right now in Europe. We have some 5 million people who have left Ukraine, 14 million displaced internally. And I was mentioning earlier to uh, the Honorable Lloyd uh, Axworthy that uh, should there be a war and Ukraine loses it, um, there would be 15 to 20 million refugees in Europe and it would be a flood. It would be a humanitarian disaster. And so the West can sit back now or drip and drab aid Ukraine or they can give Ukraine the big aid and help Ukraine win this war soon. If we can do it by Christmas, I'd love it, but I'm not dreaming. But anyhow, I'll turn it over to you to talk about um, more of your expertise on this situation. Well, thank you very much for the uh, invitation. And uh, I want to begin by apologizing for not being at the uh, dinner last night. I felt badly. I was at my advancing state and age when you get the sniffles. You always are a little concerned that you don't want to spread that around. But I'm very grateful that uh, Erika Balan sort of uh, took the honor in, in my uh, regard. And uh, as some of you know, uh, she and uh, her husband, Bill, have been close friends and uh, actually mentors to me. What I know about Ukraine, I owe very much to the uh, ongoing association, friendship, and uh, an incredible understanding of, of, of the Balans. And I think uh, Boris, the brother, is here too. I think we saw him this morning. So. I, uh, I am very, very pleased that uh, the, the honor really should have been going to them anyway, uh, because I think of the, the work that they've done. And in saying that, I, I also want to just uh, pay a short moment of uh, recognition to uh, somebody in the audience who I've worked with. Uh, I would say next to Olya Gross, who was my co-chair at the, when we did the election observer mission in 2019, the ambassador uh, who's here, who. Uh, so we introduced us to all the nooks and crannies of uh, Ukraine politics at the time. And I, I mentioned that for one reason. Uh, Oli and I were talking uh, before the session about uh, uh, how, how chilling it is uh, for those of us who are kind of detached 
watching this conflict emerge through the screens and, uh, and realizing that places you had visited, people you had talked to, uh, who are now living in a, in a holy hell and fighting, as, as the ambassador from Ukraine has said, on behalf of all of us, uh, just what an incredible sort of sense of responsibility that carries. Uh, we, we have a responsibility to protect in this area, and we have the capacity to do it. And that's what I really want to, if I might, sort of focus uh, on today's session in, in my portion. We're talking about geopolitics. Uh, that's a very big word to cover, just a lot of uh, really quite strange and weird, complex dynamics taking place. But there's a couple of things that are clear, is that uh, Putin and the Russians are shifting increasingly into a total war uh, commitment. It's no longer just the battlefield, the, the real people who are on the front lines are the civilians. Putin has made it a war against people. And that itself, when we talk about a democracy, that threat to individuals, to communities, to the, the well-being of ordinary people is something that I think is such a, a powerful threat and risk to all of us because we see so many signs of it emerging in different parts of the world. And so this ability to, to come to grips, and, and you mentioned the issue of refugees, as some of you know, I chair the World Refugee Migration Council, and we've been working very actively on a number of what we think would be ways in, to support and, uh, and enable uh, the large number of refugee flow that's coming from Ukraine, uh, not only to be settled, but also to be accepted and to have the opportunity to return, to be able to go back to a country that is being rebuilt, that they have the ability to kind of become, uh, in a sense, uh, a reserve that can go back in, as we've said, to help in that enormous issue of restoration. But it's not gonna happen easily, because right now one of the other geopolitical issues is the whole question of that uh, horrible uh, thing called money. You know, when I first studied in graduate school political science, there was always the question of, of who governs. Well, who governs is those who've got the money to govern. And that's what's beginning to happen is I think that the enormous outflow to support the military efforts of Ukraine is now being matched by the increasingly important sort of contributions that have to be made in terms of the people of Ukraine and the reparations that go. And I think this is where Canada has a special role to play. I, I, as some of you I know, I always believed when I was foreign minister that w we had a certain vocation. Uh, we could be a little bit more nimble. We could be a little bit more creative. We could use our convening powers. We could find ways in which we could bring other groups together. We could work with the civil societies. And we tried to pioneer a series of efforts around which we could rewrite the script of geopolitics. Sure, you know, the big guys with the armies uh, and the power, but there's also a lumbering that goes with that. It is, you get tied into conventional sort of pathways. And I think this is where Canada really has a, uh, I guess what the uh, sort of uh, environmentalists would call a wayfaring, uh, with the ability to tack and move in a way that really reads the scene. And here's what I read right now that if we are uh, in the next three or four months, in the winter months, are not able to provide some uh, new direction to recharge the initiative, to rethink some of the activities in order to give new life and energy and resources into the battle, into the issue, then I think that we're gonna increasingly find ourselves on the defensive. Uh, the ambassador mentioned the enormous power of Russian propaganda was just misstates. I mean, they turned the world on its head that they are somehow the victims and are the, they're the ones who are being uh, persecuted uh, be, because uh, they're, they want to keep the bridge in Crimea uh, on their own. They're now talking about their ships. Oh my goodness, their, horrible, their wonderful Baltic Black Sea fleet is being attacked by the Ukrainians. Well, you know, they, they shouldn't do that after all. I mean, that's against international law. And we never hear about the other side of the transgressions of international law that take place every single day. So let me, if, if I might, for a uh, put some thoughts and ideas uh, forward. The, the first one, uh, and I, I put it out because I think uh, the Ukrainian-Canadian Congress 
uh, has a, a very powerful role to play in helping to generate, to be the, the incubator out of which uh, some new initiative and thinking can take place. Here's one that I think could really account for two very fundamental goals. One is accountability, and the second is money. And what I'm really talking about is that right now there is something like $200 billion of Russian assets frozen through sanctions. And that, that accumulates day by day, week by week. There's a lot of piggy banks around the world are sitting on frozen money from the oligarchs, from the Russian government, from its allies, and from its collaborators like the Iranians. So one of the things we did at the Refugee Council a couple of years ago, we started talking with, with the government of Canada and with other governments about the idea of repurposing frozen money, to take the money that's sitting in those piggy banks and redirect it to where those people who have been victimized by the war, who have been victimized by the aggression are taking place. Now, that sounds like a Robin Hood prescription, but it's a very practical one. And we, the, uh, through Minister Friedland and Minister Ojuli, we already have in this country, in the budget bill, a commitment that Canada will begin to look at how to repos reposition and repurpose the tens of billions of dollars that are in Canada right now. I could, by the way, if, if we want on the side, I could tell you already several places where you could go, uh, including in this town. Uh, and that really means that we have to sort of really zero in on how do we begin to sort of identify and then take into a legal process the ill-begotten gains that have been derived from aggression and corruption and, uh, and victimization of people and return it to those who are victimized. You mentioned uh, that there was, what, 11, 12 million refugees. Well, already some of the cracks in that refugee system are beginning to appear. Uh, the, the English are talking about lack of housing. Uh, American Republicans are saying, oh my God, isn't it, how do we ask our taxpayers for more money? I'm, t I'm telling you, and I can say this with about as, as much sort of force I, I can develop a, in, uh, in 50 years of being in public life, that there is a solution and an effect and that Canada should take the lead in providing a coalition and network of other countries to take frozen assets by the Russians and convert it back to the help of Ukraine. <laughs> One more thing. And if anybody wants to hear more, I'm open for business. <laughs> Secondly, just other one point, and the, the chair is very kind to let me uh, continue for a moment. I also believe strongly that uh, there is a major diplomatic push that needs to, to be made on war crimes. Uh, that the evidence is accumulating by the bushel. You don't have to be a forensic expert to know just how many of the transgressions are taking place, the murdering, the bombing, the killing, the invasions, these are all contrary to international law, they're con con contrary to our charter, they're contrary to basic sense of human decency. And we have to be hold the Russians and Putin and his generals and his soldiers to account. Now, uh, there's all kinds of investigations going on, but you know, it's stalled for the moment. I gotta tell you folks, it's time we had indictments Let's get to the point where we name the criminals and bring them to trial and hold them accountable for their actions. And here is where, here, here's a place where again Canada can play a role because we know that business. We were part of the original International Criminal Court. We've got all kinds of experts in this country who can help move it along. But I think the diplomatic side is to start pushing for this kind of initiative, and I would like to see, uh, if I might, I'm not in government, well, but all Canadian ambassadors all over the place, I think it's time that we imported a special envoy for international war crimes in Ukraine from Canada and let that person go to town and mobilize and convene and, and energize the whole issue to make sure that war crimes, and I can give you just one piece of evidence, I know 
history is not often given much honor. But when I was foreign minister, I was heavily involved in, in the Kosovo uh, problem. And I was one of those who committed Canada to a military action to stop the, the murder and the aggrandizement of the Serbians in Kosovo. And we can debate that. But what I also know is I was part of a foreign minister's group that met to try to get sort of the accountability. And it was fortunately, uh, sort of, we had a, 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 a Canadian who was head of the tribunal in the Balkans who brought forward indictments of Milosevic and six of his cronies. I gotta tell you folks that within 72 hours of that indictment, Milosevic was at the table pleading uh, for peace. As someone said, he was losing, once you get named and shamed as a war criminal, then all of a sudden, the people around you don't wanna be at the next Christmas party or on your Christmas card. <laughs> and I think it's about time that we made sure. And, 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 and here is a political, uh, here's a political angle to it. You know, there's a, a lot of concern about the way so many other countries around the world, in the South and others, are kind of sitting on the fence uh, because they think, well, you know, the Russians uh, helped build a port and uh, we're listening to all that propaganda and uh, why make a decision? You start naming Putin and his people as war criminals and you can go to every other government and, uh, and say, are you prepared to so support war criminal activity? Because one of these days it's gonna come and bite you, you know where it hurts. And so folks, I think there's an area, just two alone, and by the way, if I had another, and I know you won't because I think you're, you're already looking at me in a very sort of a stern way, I think that there is a couple of other ways that, that candidates should really take the lead in, in bringing together all of the countries that have plighted their commitments and with the Ukraine government and say, how do we begin to sort of put more juice, more energy and more mobilization and more creativity and put, bring, the, bring the battle back to Putin, make him feel embarrassed, make him feel under pressure. And as a war criminal with no money in his bank because we've taken it from him, then you're gonna find a real change. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's always, uh, thank you so much, and it's always good when you have um, somebody who's not maybe part of the diplomatic corps who can speak more freely out here, and, uh, and we could do a whole hour with you at any time, so for the next Congress, we have an idea. Um, I wanna thank you all, because I know the, the panel here really wanted to hear your questions. They wanted to give an overview of their thoughts, but we wanna open it up to the floor, and I'm gonna ask uh, Hanya, we're, we're um, 15 minutes away? Maximum 15 minutes. We'll call it 12 and we'll stretch to 15. And uh, I see Andriy Shochenko up front and I see people at the microphone. But if you guys can step up to the microphone, that would be helpful just so everyone can hear you. And we could, uh, we could alternate um, one microphone and then the other. I don't know if we'll get all the questions in, but please address your question to somebody on the panel and we'll pass the microphone to them. And we can get more elaborate because I don't think we have time for everybody to speak on every question. So I'll turn it over to this microphone. We'll go back and forth. Go ahead, please. Miroslav Petri, Liga Ukrainian Canada. This will be a call to all our citizens. Yesterday evening, I read with fear that Ukraine already lost almost 7.7 million people, primarily women. English only. Я думаю, що був конгрес ну, українців. Ну, може, не українців вже. Добре. Окей, uh, okay, I, uh, I read yesterday that 7.7 million Ukrainians left Ukraine. Most of them, at least 7 million of them, are women. Not sure if you're familiar with the demographics of Ukraine. Now, my friends in the corner here yesterday had a a nice graphic of the demographic distribution of Ukraine. But there's a huge gap in Ukraine's population between the ages of 30 and 10. Now let me just remind you that men don't give birth. Can, can we get to a yes. question? Because we don't have time for a model. We have 7.7 .7 million or 7 million women missing 
Where is Ukraine's future? We're without the war. We're going to be down to 29 million in, in 2062. If you remove that number of women, where does our future go? Thank you. And can we make sure that 7.7 .7 million return? Thank you. Thank you. I will probably, as a woman of that age that you mentioned, <laughs> first of all, I, I'm coming back home. As the, n not, not maybe today, tomorrow, but I'm working here as many of the people are asking me, what's, what are you doing here? What's your goal here? And my goal here is to build the relations and support with Canada and to be a, and to secure the support to Ukraine. So I and my children will be able to go back home to build, rebuild Ukraine. And what is also important, uh, there are millions of Ukrainians who uh, went to outside the country because of the invasion. And that is the important thing. They are not refugees. They are people who are temporarily, and as um, uh, Roman Vashuk just told me that in Poland, the Polish people are calling Ukrainians our guests. And this is important thing what we in Ukraine and what the government of Ukraine wants. This is really our best people. Young, energetic, well-educated. This is the future of Ukraine. What we all need to do is to help Ukrainian soldiers to win the war and to bring back our best Ukrainians home. If I could just briefly piggyback onto that and maybe throw something back at the government of Ukraine. Uh, it means that the onus is also on the government of Ukraine to make Ukraine an attractive country for these people to return to. Not simply a barely tolerable country where people live in parallel with the state, but picking up on what Ambassador Galadza was saying, in this new spirit of civil society and the state working together to create that environment. And that has to happen through foreign support, but primarily through a new initiative and clear signals from the government of Ukraine as well. Yeah, uh, we'll go to microphone two, please. Hi, yes, thank you. My question is for uh, Ambassador Galadza, but I'm curious for the wisdom of the other panelists. How do we today counter the inevitability that Russia will spin their loss of the war and keep up their international information war on Ukraine because a tweet or state-backed news article in Spanish or Arabic or false comment to a UN diplomat is below the threshold of traditional war? So how do we start to um, counter the, the information war that will persist uh, where they'll try to shape the, the loss as a win for them. Thanks, that's a great question. And, and I think that I would uh, challenge your assumption that a tweet uh, in, in, in Arabic or Spanish is below the threshold. It's not anymore. Um, because the international community is realizing just how um, governments all over the world, democratic governments, are, are, are realizing the extent to which um, that disinformation campaign is insidious. It was before. <laughs> we're just seeing it more plainly now. And we're going to organize more strongly, more effectively, uh, to, 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 to hit back at it. And that's, that's, I think, is the number one reason why um, the world isn't going to be the same after this war, is because we now truly see what Putin is and who Putin is and what his game plan is in the world. Um, so, uh, you know, there are all kinds of, there are all kinds of um, uh, mechanisms being generated, and I mentioned one of them in my list of Ukraine's ambitious things they want to do, um, is to create that, that, that way of identifying disinformation, sometimes even identifying the vulnerabilities for the disinformation before the disinformation gets out there and shut it down. And that we've seen a, happening a lot with the re release of intelligence in the days leading up to the war, with the continued re releases of, of, of intelligence, the talking in advance about there's going to be a false flag and we're not gonna buy it. This worked most recently on the, um, on the dirty bomb, but which the memes in Ukrainian were just hilarious about that. Like, Anyway, um, but uh, I think we're, get, we're, we're finding ways to get out ahead of it, and we know why it's really important to get out ahead of it. 
Can I make just one comment? Uh, I'm, I'm just going to uh, sort of bounce off your question to put a somewhat you know, larger perspective. You realize that in the seven largest social media platforms are run by private billionaire men who get to make the choices and discretion of what goes on and yes. what doesn't. And therefore, you've got Mr. Musk out talking about freedom of the internet, freedom to spew out hate and anger and anti-Semitism and anti-discrimination and promote the kind of garbage that Putin and his people are putting out. I just think it's about time that we found through our international systems a way of beginning to establish different rules. I've worked on that when I was a foreign minister about the nation of setting certain norms and standards by what's acceptable and to begin to hold these very incredibly powerful private people to account in terms of the continuation of a system that gives them the freedom that they want to become multi-billionaires and end up owning Facebook, Twitter, uh, Amazon, you name it. This is really something that I think is one of the biggest issues, not of my time, but for the young people in the room, your time. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, hello, my question will build off of Alexa's a little bit, um, but Basically, we know that after um, World War II, um, a new world order was established for the most part. However, post-World War I, this was not the case. Um, so I was curious what actions should um, Ukraine, Canada, and the West overall take in order to prevent kind of a Germany post-World War I scenario? I'll, where, where, where to start? I'll take a I'll, I'll take a stab at that. Uh, Sorry, it, that's a very big question. It is. It's huge, uh, but it's one that drives concerns. If you remember things that irritated Ukrainians a lot, such as President Macron of France saying how it's important not that Putin not be humiliated. What he's he's speaking from the French experience post Versailles, or the perceived French experience post Versailles. Uh, so I think what we need is a strengthening of the system of democratic countries, much along the lines of what uh, Dr. Axworthy was proposing. It means, for example, Ukraine within the European Union, and a European Union that is more tightly uh, integrated and plugged into a defense arrangement with NATO as well. So in other words, Ukraine isn't left out there uh, to fend for itself again, as it is now, but is bound into a community of interests and, and values. Uh, we still don't know how failure in this war will work out for Russia. Will it result in regime change? Will it result in the Russian Federation actually becoming a true federation or fragmenting in some shape or form? Uh, there are obviously people who prize stability above everything else. I think we've seen the mistake as well in 89, 90, 91 of prizing stability, Bush, Chicken Kiev speech, etc. I think we, people need to be thinking ahead to how the reshaping of the international system will happen and how we can make it work for countries like ours while respecting also the interests of the global south and you know, the various global challenges, climate and, other, and others that are out there. I think we also have to look at the institutions that were supposed to prevent this from happening. And the United Nations Security Council is number one. Um, and uh, I know that it's next to impossible to change the, uh, the presence of Russia uh, and, their, and their veto power. But this, uh, what's happening uh, in Ukraine today is really redoubling efforts to do what's possible. And, and, and I think Ukrainians know that this war is testing that system. And I'm not sure yet that we know that what we currently have will survive. And, and you could say the same thing about the International Committee of the Red Cross. You saw what happened, to the, uh, uh, what happened with Amnesty International. These ideas, the limits of neutrality. 
Um, there is, these are major, major foundational principles of the international order we've had for the 70, last 70 years that are being tested, and the, we don't know the conclusion yet. And while build upon what, what was said, there is, there are, I think, one more important thing missing, as from Ukraine's perspective. What, if we come back before the invasion, one of the rhetorics and the pretext that Putin was uh, saying it was Ukraine shouldn't be a NATO member, as the Finland. And many of the European leaders, of, some of them were saying, Ukraine should choose the path of Finlandization. And now we, we support this path. <laughs> so finally, I, this uh, war also already is doing the tecton tectonical changes. Look on Finland, look on Sweden, the countries for which for the years we're keeping this neutrality. The most what has changed, the mood of the people. So the people supported in Finland, in Sweden, the countries to join NATO. Nobody even thought two, three years ago that they will be joining the NATO on such a speed. And Canada was the first uh, to make the, to approve uh, the adherence to NATO. And this is another thing that many of the NATO members need to rethink about the Ukraine. Because after the war, it will be, Ukraine will strengthen NATO. Look on, on the reality now. Ukrainian soldiers has been trained with the support of the Canada for the NATO standards. And this is the army which has now the strong experience on the battlefield. Second, Ukraine, um, has, is using NATO standard weapons, which we, if we look back eight months ago, was the first military supply. Many of the countries said never Ukraine could get NATO standard weapons. What we see now is more and more different type of the weapons trained and used in Ukraine. The third thing is what happens, it's not so much being talked, but also with the support of Canadian government is still the continuation of the reform inside the defense sector, even despite of the war. These things are going through and we really appreciate this support of, uh, of Canada in providing us this technical support for the things to move on. So Ukraine is the one who will strengthen the NATO. And this is important. Another thing is, is also the the challenge for many organizations, as Ambassador Galadza said, Security Council, Red Cross, OECE, and so on. They, most of them were not in Ukraine within the first two, three weeks of the war. Many of the protocols just like, even the ones who should work as the first responders, this was only the civil society of Ukraine and the people of Ukraine who were doing this job. And for many of them, it's just unbelievable. That's the same as for many people who still don't even can, cannot realize that Russia could, could lose. For many of the people around, it's just impossible to believe because the, the big country and so on and so forth. And I was a witness of that. Uh, there is one UN organization which actually is the first where Russia was kicked off from the governing body. This is AKO. This was the first time since 19... 46, that Russia was, was kicked off was, as, as the permanent member of the AKO Council. And I had a lot of conversation with people around that. The world is changing. The people sometimes, even if it's in precedent, the people are changing the way. And we need to work all together to help this message to go through. And this one, 143 votes when the latest UN assembly, it's a very important sign that we are getting more and more countries realizing how important it's not only for Ukraine, but how important it is to the global peace and order. Thank you. Go ahead, sir. I'm just gonna give you a short answer because I know you've got planes to catch, but uh, I want to say three words, responsibility to protect. It's about time that we began to accept 
that if we're going to work in a global system, we have to undertake the obligations to make sure that we protect people. And that means whether it's the ravages of climate, of aggression, of corruption, or of a breakdown of their societies. And I think the point is, our institutions right now are not doing that. But I'm always inspired, because you wanted to go back in history, about the example of Lester Mike Pearson in 1956, when there was a major aggression taking place, the Security Council was stymied. He came forward with a proposal of a Uniting for Peace resolution at the General Assembly that set up a peacekeeping force, and peacekeeping became the Canadian motif for the next 50 years until a previous government basically shut it down. I think we have to think about those kinds of antecedents and precedents about how we've been able to establish a fundamental principle that we are all in this together. The boundaries increasingly are invisible. We talk about how about people moving back from Canada, Ukraine. In 10 years time, the mobility around this planet is gonna be so intense, it, you, you will have to have a global identity card. And you should have because talent and skill and romance and commitment don't have boundary limitations. And I just think that's really the, the challenge. And I, I keep going back because I know what my own limitations are. I'm a Canadian and I'm proud of what we can do. And I'm simply saying, I want us to see it take a lead on beginning to cut the edge on some of these fundamental questions that the ambassadors have raised. Super, thank, thank you. you. Um, thank you so much, all of you. I think that was a, a fitting end to our last question. I'm sorry for those who's, who are standing. We've been told we have to end our session. Um, but it was nice that all four of you were able to participate jointly on that last answer. And I want to, um, first of all, thank our sponsors, the BCU Foundation and BCU Financial for supporting this session. Again, it's truly, uh, it's truly uh, pleasant to see our community standing up and, and funding the Congress. Um, I want to, to say that it's been a true honor leading this panel. It was a terrific engagement by all of them. Um, the audience, you couldn't hear a pin drop. You guys were excellent throughout. Thank you. So it meant, must have been a great topic. And I want to thank our four speakers. You guys were just absolutely wonderful. Thank you all. Distinguished uh, panelists, guests, I know that the uh, audience has already expressed its thanks to you, but I would like to add my thanks. Sorry. So, Ambassador Kovalu, you were appointed ambassador to Canada at a critical time in Ukraine's history. You did not have the luxury of being acclimatized you landed in Canada, you hit the ground running, and we've been running to catch up to you ever since. Ambassador Galadza, three years ago, you attended this Congress on the very eve of your appointment as Canada's ambassador to Ukraine, and now you embrace, I would say, the most challenging diplomatic portfolio in Canada. And Romane, I was going to call you our eminence grise, our city cardinal, and then you got a haircut and all the gray is gone. <laughs> but we thank you for being Canada's, one of Canada's most prominent voices in support of Ukraine and for which we are always grateful. And I leave Dr. Axworthy to the end, not out of disrespect, but because it is my privilege to present to you now the Ukrainian Canadian Congress, Taras Shevchenko Medal. Because you weren't able to join us last night. I just want to say a few words. Dr. Axworthy is a prominent Canadian 
and a great friend of Ukraine. He has served as a politician and as an elder statesman. And now in your work as chair of the Refugee and Migration Council, you are examining the freezing of assets for the reconstruction of Ukraine. And as our friend Marcus Kolga says, we are going to freeze them, seize them, and sell them. And that is a mantra that we embrace. And I know that, Dr. Axworthy, you will support the formation of a beneficial ownership registry, which is essential to that effort. And so I'd love to have coffee with you. Get your list, and we'll take it. And those will be the first names on that beneficial ownership registry. So uh, without further ado, it is my privilege to present you with the Shevchenko Medal. And to our other panelists, Hanya will present you uh, with a token of our appreciation, the uh, watercolor of Taras Shevchenko before the Manitoba legislature. <laughs> 